teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mary, pray for us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. All right, so today, October 24th, is the feast of Mar Hara. And I know you all do know Nina's and devotions to him. So, for the excuses to Rita and Fifa, who had the sermon this morning. <coughs> St. Harath is one of, he was the main figure in the church of Najran, Najran. <clears throat> Najran is a city that lies on the border between what's now Saudi Arabia and Yemen, so all the area that's being blown up. So it's a southwestern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, the importance of the city of Najran is that it's one of the first places where Christianity was established on the Arab Peninsula. So we're so used to thinking of Arabia as only being Muslim, we forget that for centuries there were Arab tribes that were Jewish. They had adopted rabbinical Judaism, as we mentioned how the, how the Khazar, Khazars do later on. In the early centuries, there's a real proselytization movement. Northern Mesopotamia and also became rabbinical Judaic. And so you had tribes in the south that became Jewish, and you had tribes in the south that became Christian, and some tribes that just remained pagan. So St. Harath is a major figure here in Najran in this area. They were also, they were textiles. And after they convert to Islam, they also become the ones who put the, who make the great cloth that goes over the Kaaba in Mecca, you know, that's covered in a the cloth. They were the weavers of it in the, for the early centuries. But Najran is an area that received Christianity probably, well, we don't know exactly where from, and maybe through Ethiopia from Aksum. But in any case, what is fascinating about this is that the city of Najran was basically Christian. And in the late 400s, early 500s, you have one of the tribes who's sheikh, their chief, their king. His name is Dunawas. Not that it makes much difference, but that's the name. Dunawas is Jew. He's Jewish. And he unleashes a huge persecution in the early 500s against Najran. Part of it's political, but part of it is religious. And he forces these, this tribe, these people, to renounce Christianity. And this goes on for a number of years, this combat. We have documents, historical documents from the time, where he gloats over the piles of consecrated virgins and priests that he sets on fire, the bodies of the people that were killed. In the end, over these years, probably about 20,000 people are killed. That's a rough estimate given. But amongst them is St. Hardeth, because he's one of the main figures. We don't know if he was a priest or the bishop, but he was one of the main figures in that. So it's, today's feast day is the feast of St. Hardeth. In the Greek version of the name, the name is Aretas. Aretas. This name comes up in the Acts of the Apostles because the king of Damascus, when St. Paul 
the king of the the the, the king of Damascus is trying to arrest Saint Paul, and it's the famous moment where all he can do is get he can't leave the city through the gates because he'll be arrested. So he goes to one of the buildings where he's taking refuge in, and they lower him out of the window, which looks out over the top of the wall, so he can be lowered down on the outside, and then he can escape up the city walls from Damascus. The king at the time is known as King Aretas. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, his name will be Aretas, but in the Arabic, it's Hareth or Hadez. All right, so that's who we commemorate today. He died in 523. So about a century after St. Mary's death, he dies in the lower Arabian Peninsula. And so it's just one of those little interesting details. Because of course, 523, that's about 50 years before the date that's given traditionally for the birth of Muhammad. Okay? So these are all connected. Now we'll leave you with one connection with the modern world. A century after the death of St. Hadda, these people don't convert, they're martyred. So they remain Christians. And when Muhammad comes onto the scene, I mean, the story, the way it's always told, is everybody in Arabia was pagan. He made them all adore the one God. And isn't that kind of glorious? Well, no. He, he actually, when he was invited to the town of Yathrib, which is now known as Medina, he was invited by one of the tribes there, clans there, that was Jewish again. <coughs> Now, Medina, of course, is completely Muslim because a century after the death of St. Hadith and the Companions, 523, about a century later, uh, the Khalifa, Umar, Omar, orders the deportation of all of the Arabs who will not renounce their Christianity. He deports them to the north. Because he rules at that point, no one in Arabia will allow to be there unless they are Muslim. And so he deports all these people. And the people of Najran are deported to the north. The reason why this connects with the modern world is that these people went to Mesopotamia, which was Christian then. So they went, took refuge in the north. They lived in the north. The tragedy is, of course, Prior to the year 2000, there were well over a million and a half Christians in Iraq, in a country, so that was over 10% of the population was still Christian. Now, of course, after this, I think we've been able to chisel it down to about 400,000. And the rest of them have either been killed or forced into exile or just to flee. So what the Caliph could not succeed in doing the West, the so-called Christian West, has succeeded in forcing these people who had retained their faith for centuries to completely leave the Middle East. That's so pretty tragic, but it's a connection with the modern world. So that's the feast day today. October, well, October 24th. Technically, it's already sundown, so it's already October 25th. But October 24th is the feast of St. Hadar and companions. All right. I have brought out napkins because I couldn't find any paper towels because I have not been cleaning this board and so I'm afraid that this is all becoming permanent. So I have to use my Windex. <laughs> I should have cleaned it last week. Father, can I offer a little piece of history? Sure. And Today's also my eighth anniversary of being a subdeacon. So oh, really? <laughs> Excuse me for the vain glory, I just realized that. <laughs> so you took as your patron St. Hadith? No, I didn't. I kept Stephen, but it's, I should, I, it's nice to know that guy's name. So well, it's here. nice to know these histories because we, all, we never think about all the Christians who died in Arabia. Right, yeah. You know, one of the great saints is St. Isaac of Nineveh. Because for a brief time he was bishop in Nineveh, and he still didn't want to be bishop, so he became a hermit again. But his writings exist to this day, the Syriac writings. The Greeks absolutely love him. We call him Isaac of Nineveh. He's born in the 8th century, but he wasn't born in Nineveh. He was born in Qatar. Qatar had a large Christian community in the 700s. Still. 
like in Bahrain. Bahrain also had a large Christian community. It's helpful when you're an island. They can't get you. Actually, that came out pretty well. All right. So that's part of the fascination of the history. And as we do this history to try to bring us up to the time of St. Merit, we'll talk about the date when Aksum, when Ethiopia converts to Christianity. They're also one of the first countries to convert, the Ethiopians. What's now northern Ethiopia is a country. Much of Ethiopia is Muslim, but the northern parts are the Christian parts. All right. So we left off last week on point number seven on the Dea Tesserof, the Dea Tesserof. So the gospel that was being used was a combination of the four memoirs of the apostles, or the four gospels, and made into one continuous story to be read. All right. So that was also very popular among the Greeks too, but for the Syriacs, it hung on for a very long time. As we mentioned, it was used from the second century, from the 100s until the 400s, until the 5th century, they used this one book. So all the commentaries of St. Ephraim on the scriptures in the New Testament are a commentary on the Diatessero. Then we mention, so we'll continue using the same number 7. Peshitta. The Peshitta is, in the Syriac tradition, the version of the sacred scriptures. Now we left off with that last week by talking about the fact that Peshitta is the equivalent in Syriac of the word for the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. And again, it doesn't mean vulgar in the sense of the way we use the word. But the word vulgar means popular. In French, it's funny because they have a term which is called vulgarisation, to vulgarize something. But it doesn't at all mean kick it in the gutter. It means to make it understandable by the common population. <coughs> So you take an academic treatise that no one can possibly read, not even academics, and you chew it up and digest it, and then you vulgarize it so people can understand what the heck this guy was trying to say. All right? So Peshitta has the same sense of common. It means simple. So it was meant to be a text that the people could listen to and hear. Because to read it in, in Koine Greek, which is a literary Greek in that, they're not going to understand. So, because you know that the Vulgate is put together by St. Jerome in the late 300s, but there are Latin texts translated from the second century on, perhaps even in the first century, because Latin is what a lot of the population spoke, not Greek. The Greek is being drawn around. So the Syriac translation becomes known as the Peshitta. All right. Now, in the Diatessaron, that's just giving us our Gospels in the New Testament. The Peshitta will become the complete and standard text in the 6th century. So in the 500s. In the 400s is going to be all the theological arguments. And that's why the Diatessaron is going to fall out of usage because it, they want the actual text themselves and from the 6th century to the 8th century there's a movement to make the text very literal straight from the Greek. How many of you in the old days remember the Douay Reims Bible? It is not a pretty text to listen to or to read. The King James was meant to be read publicly and is filled with poetry. But because it's filled with that poetry, it's not actually, in all points, a completely accurate translation. The Douay Reims is practically word for word transliterated out of the Latin and Greek text into English. And it was done that way because the Catholics had to defend their butts 
while everyone was being exterminated by Henry VIII and later on by Elizabeth. So these texts were meant to be in the hands of the educated classes who could read, so they would have the scriptures in front of them. And the Dewey Reams actually predate the King James Bible. It's now admitted that some of the King James actually is influ influenced by the Catholic translation into English. So, but it's done specifically to give you a text that you can discuss and argue from as the Protestant revolutions taking place around you and everything's burning. Okay? So what happens is the Dia Tessera works really well. The Evangelion Dam right? The, the, the Gospel of the Mixed. It works just fine for centuries, but now when we start fighting over the expression of who is Jesus and what is Jesus in the 400s, you want the actual memoirs of the apostles, as they were called then, the Gospels. You want the actual text so that these can, things can be discussed and argued over correctly with the testimonies that we have in the written scriptures. All right, so you understand where this is coming from. Now in the Old Testament, of course, what you're primarily using is the Old Testament is the Old Testament Syriac usage. There's no form of diatessero. And in the Diatessera, when they quote, they're not quoting from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which predates our Lord by three centuries. Now, when you read the Greek New Testament, or even when you read it in the English, the Greek New Testament is quoting from the Septuagint. The apostles are not quoting from the Hebrew text. Sometimes, the, we know because there's a variation in the text from Isaiah or whatever they're using, we can see the variation. So we know that what they're quoting is the Greek translation of the Septuagint and not the Hebrew text. So what's happening in the Syriac world is when the New Testament is being used, and you have St. Paul or write, or the Gospels are written by saying, as it was said by Isaiah, they're quoting in the Greek text, they're quoting the Septuagint. But the translator in the Peshitta is, transla is quoting from the Syriac translation of the Old Testament. Make sense? So that's why the Peshitta is so important for exegetical studies of the scriptures. Because they're giving you very, very early translations, interpretations, of text, of course, we don't have the Greek text themselves from the year 47. Have, those texts have all fallen apart. We have translation, we have the text copied and brought to us. But we can go look at a text that say here, this is the copy that St. Matthew wrote with his own pen. Uh, for obvious reasons, after 2,000 years, these things fall apart. So remember what we talked about, though, is that the Old Testament translation, much of them are what we call the Targumim. So in the Old Testament, it's, uh, much of it is from the Targumim. Remember in the Hebrew, Targum, one Targum, two Targumim the plural of it. And the Targums are Aramaic translations of the classical Hebrew, because nobody speaks classical Hebrew. Right? So you have the Targumim, but the Targumim that are circulating around the synagogues, you also have Jews who are converting to Christianity, they bring these translations. And actually some of the Targumim that we have that are used in the synagogues may very likely themselves be translations in the Aramaic done by Christians. It shows you the overlap between the synagogue and the Christian churches in Aramea. Now, I also left off by telling you that when, in the Quran, when they speak of the gospel, it's always singular. And that reference is probably to the... 
to the to the um, the heterodox versions of Christianity that are in the remnant out in the desert, who may probably still be using the old Peshitta Diatessaro, which of course would only be one book, one text. Because the references in the Quran are only to the gospel as a single book that the Christians have. I highly recommend for anyone who's interested in this period of time and especially in the formation of Islam, that you read Tom Holland's book. It came out about mm, five or six years ago. Tom Holland is a professor of history, I think, at Oxford. He's, some, he's an English professor, but he's like 38. Right? And it's a very readable book. It is called In the Shadow of the Sword. Because he talks about all of these Arab tribes that were Christian, some of them were Orthodox Christians, and a lot of them were versions of non-Orthodox or heterodox Christianity. A lot of them served as mercenaries fighting for the Byzantine Empire in the West and the Persian Empire in the East. And then an awareness of a national identity among the tribes. It's a fascinating book, absolutely intriguing. But it covers this period of time leading up to Muhammad, the, the praised one. Okay? So, brilliant book. Easy to read. I'm telling you that now because when you see the book, it's big. <laughs> a lot of people I know, they look at a big book and they go, mm. Mm. It's over 150 pages. I'm not reading it. So, but this, this, this book is like, 500 pages. I mean, it's a good-sized book. But it's very easy. To, Tom Holland is an excellent writer. Very good. But it, it will open up to you that entire part of the planet on a religious basis, and you will understand who the Maronites are much better by studying this history of where Islam comes from. Okay? Now, we mentioned to you that by the late by the early 400s, these, it's Theodoret of Cyrus, the writer who is the one who gives us the testimony of the ascetics in Aramea, who winds up being one of the main figures of why all of our texts of the Diatessaron have disappeared. We don't have complete copies of the Syriac Diatessaron. We have it in Armenian translations. We have other things, but we don't have that. All right, so that's number seven. Any questions? All right, number eight. Number eight is one of these fascinating questions about the canon. That one's dead. So I'll just put down canon. And of course, canon in Greek just means standard. It means a rule. Oh, sorry. Ah. It actually, the word actually means rule, measure. And so it, it has also the notion of standard. This is the meaning behind the word canonization. Canonization means you just officially recognize it as being a standard measurement. So when you canonize someone, you're saying, this person's life represents manifestly the life of living the gospel. That's all it means. You canonize them. You give them as a standard. Therefore, they're honored and they're imitated. Right? So the whole story of St. Hara is recognition these are people worthy of imitation. But what's interesting in the Aramaic world, as you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament, they're not books. They're collections of books. And the book that we call the Bible itself means books. Biblia means books in Greek. It doesn't mean a book. So people talk about the good book. It's not the good book. It's the good library or the good books. Because you have to understand that because when you read it, when you read the Old Testament, these books have been written over 1,500 years. 
There are definitely different styles and different vocabulary <coughs> and different concepts that they're even portraying in the teaching of over 15 centuries. Well, depending on the translations, yeah, what you're working with. So what happens is, is that when you have that development, you have to understand the context in which they're written to get the uh, proper understanding of the sequential teachings that go throughout those centuries. Whereas the New Testament, of course, is a product of 40, 50 years. So that's much easier to read in a historical unity. Now, when we talk about this, the reason why the Old Testament, and we mentioned this in passing a few weeks ago, the Old Testament standard for the church was the Septuagint. And Septuagint is abbreviated with the Roman numerals for 70, because the Septuaginta in Greek means 70. Right? Or in Latin, <coughs> Septuaginta, the 70. So Septuaginta. And it refers to the 70 translators. The traditional story is that there were 70 rabbis translating the classical <coughs> texts. They were invited to go to Egypt. And they were invited to then for the Jews in Alexandria to translate. The story is the seven rabbis are sequestered away, each in their own little studio and cell, and they work over a period of time. And when they all come out, they produce exactly the same text, each one of them word for word. That's the story in Greek. But of course, it's already three centuries before our Lord the importance of a translation because nobody speaks classical Hebrew anymore. So you have to have a translation. But remember that our Aramaic world is not using this translation because they speak a Semitic language. It's easier for them. They don't, they're not going to go from classical Hebrew to Greek and then go into Syriac when you could just go Hebrew Aramaic. Okay. So when we talk about the canon, the question becomes, what books are inspired by God? What are the inspired texts? And because this is from three centuries, the non-Palestinian, non-Hebrew-speaking peoples all look to the Septuagint as their <coughs> official translation. Four centuries. Which is why the Greek-speaking church in that first generation uses this text as its official list of inspired texts. All right? But the Targumim and for the Peshitta, they're not using this text. It's why the importance, we spend so much time on the Council of Yamne in the year 90 when the Pharisees started pulling this collection of books apart which is the reason why in the Protestant Revolution they follow the rabbinical Jews of the year 90 in their listing of what are the inspired texts. But as I mentioned to you, those rabbis, the, the beginning of the formation of what we know as modern day rabbinical Judaism, they're using their nationalistic concepts as a criteria. Therefore, if the book was not written originally in Hebrew, it can't be inspired. So that knocked out the books of Maccabees, that knocked out the book of Wisdom, that knocked out parts of Daniel that are written in Aramaic, that knocked out the whole book of Tobias, Tobit, which is written in Aramaic. And that's how you get the fact that there are more books in the Old Testament for the Catholics. Because they just simply kept using the same text. The Greek Orthodox, the Catholics, they all have basically the same books. The Greeks, for some reason, have a Psalm 151, mm -hmm. and they have a third and a fourth Maccabees, but that's a historical question. What about right? Esdras? Esdras? Esdras is Hebrew. That's one of the ones in the list. That's, mm -hmm. Whether you divide Esdras and Nehemiah is a question of editorial. All right. So, but that's what's happened in year 90. So year 90, it's 60 years after our Lord's ascension. The church doesn't care what the rabbinical Jews who have refused the Messiah are <coughs> doing. They don't care. 
right? And that's why you never had the silver trumpet's definition of a canon of the list of scriptures until people started going, those aren't part of it, which of course is in the 16th century. So 1,500 years after our Lord, the Protestants start going, that book doesn't belong to it, that book doesn't belong to it. Luther said, the book of Revelation of John, that's probably not scripture either, and neither is the book of St. James. He starts pulling out the New Testament too. And it sort of horrifies all the Catholics, and that's why at the Council of Trent, you come out with an official listing, but it's been a listing we've had since the beginning. It's just to make it, no, this is not arguable. These are the inspired texts. I was going to say, Father, when they were doing that in the 16th century, they were referring back to the... Oh, yeah, always tradition. Everything's always referred to tradition. Yeah, so, so they were arguing based on that rabbinical <laughs> list and not the true list. The Protestants. But, but they're going way back. Well, they're, they're going, going... What their argument was is they're just... They're ignoring all the tradition. Right. We have nothing. We are scholars, and the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and therefore, who should be able to tell us about the Hebrew Scriptures? The Jews. Now, there's a fascinating side bit on this, is that St. Jerome, who obviously learned his Hebrew from the rabbis in Palestine, he had a great sympathy to those rabbinical interpretations. So while he translated into the Latin usage for the proper official translation of the scriptures, there's parts of them that editorially he puts in different, they're all there, all the books of the Septuagint are there, but he'll take parts of Daniel, for example, that the rabbis didn't accept as being scripture, and he'll put them as an appendix on the book of Daniel. Because he doesn't want to say they're not scripture, because, you, because he knows the tradition of the Christian church. But at the same time, he's a bit partial to the rabbis who have been telling them why it's not scripture. So you see St. Jerome in the 300s already kind of like, mm -hmm. but he already has a, a 400 year long tradition, almost four centuries, 350 year tradition. He knows that this is what the church represents. And so it's one of those little fascinating details. And in the New Testament, well, it didn't fit with their ideas. So, you know, so St. James saying in his epistle that faith without works is dead, well that just goes completely against Luther's heretical ideas, and so he doesn't hold that to scripture. Right. So, but the church is always on tradition. What has been used? And so they've been using for three centuries this Greek translation of the Old Testament, everybody has, and that, well, the Greek speakers at least, and so it's got to be authoritative. In fact, the father, there are many fathers in the church, including St. Augustine, who considered this translation to be inspired, not just the Hebrew text, but the Greek translation. Now, the church never accepted that as being an official doctrine, but you have a number of the fathers who hold that it was, because, of course, they're also following the story of the 70 translators. Okay? Now, what the standard is, a lot of this is, is what is the church been doing? This is why only in the 20th century have we ever stopped and written a new liturgy. We've never sat down and written a liturgy. All right. So the Latins did this in the 1960s. They created more anaphoras than that. And we've streamlined the bet using older texts. But it's always been building on things that we've had by tradition. The ancestors give us this in our generation. We use it. We benefit from it. And then we die. And we're handing it off to the next generation. So that's always been the vision. So in the question of the canon, the scriptures, what are the inspired texts, the question was, is who's using them? Are they being used in the liturgy? All right? There's no Gideon Bibles in the hotel rooms. The question is, is what is being proclaimed in the divine presence? Remember, the mysteries are about presence. They're not about memorializing something that happened a long time ago. They are about the presence of God incarnate in the front of us, the Christ himself, substantially in the Eucharist, in the word proclaimed by the scriptures. That's what mystery rozo is. It's the manifestation of the divine presence. All right? And it's one of the reasons why in the East the ceremonies were long, because the idea was is that in the rep repetition of these prayers and the services, that these weren't just ceremonies. 
You were participating <coughs> in moving into that divine parousia, the divine presence by which your being assimilated into that divine light. And the rozo, the sacrament, is meant to be the mystery of the veil that when you die, you simply enter into the light. So what are you doing every Sunday? Every Sunday you're becoming more and more Christ-like because you stand in front of the Holy One. Kadishat Aloho, you are holy, O God. Kadishat Hayel Tono, you are, you are holy, mighty one. That's the idea behind it. And so the ceremonies, especially in the East, yeah, they're long. If it's, you know, 2018, you want to get in and get out, it's like, you know, that lasted longer than 45 minutes. This is unacceptable. You know. How long was the Melkite Mass when you were growing up? Long. How many hours? It was about an hour and a half. Okay, well, that's still kind of short. The Orthodox are still going longer. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, when you were a child, the Maronite Mass was going for an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the idea was is that part of it is that, yes, some of the things, not everything, but some of the things were repeated, the litanies. But the idea was is that you're entering into the presence of the mystery. Now the problem is, is we have a real hard time in the Western world, especially in America, because we're so affected by non-liturgical Christianity. For us, it was a lecture, some scripture reading, and some hymns. Get in and get out. Well, it wasn't getting to get out. If you were alive in the time of Calvin and Luther, you sat there for a two and a half hour sermon because it was a professorial lecture, right? I mean, you can go to the congregational churches right throughout New England and see the staff that has a brass ball on one end and a feather on the other end. Those are for the vergers, the ushers. And during those three hour ceremonies and come lectures, <laughs> if you're nodding, the usher for the ladies would use the feather end and just tickle their face and wake them up. And the men, boom, got the brass ball. <laughs> so when we say long or short, I mean, it's not. But of course, you know, the idea, the length of time, but it was a totally different mentality. The divine mystery was for us to enter into. The reason why I go into this is because the importance was, is how do you determine the divine word, the presence of God's proclamation, well, is, is it being read? Is it being announced in that divine presence that we call the Eucharist? That was the idea. And so the question then was judgment coming that way. And most of the Western world were pretty much on the same page with the New Testament as we know it. But in Aramea, it was slightly different. But you can keep that thought and have your caffeine break. Yeah. We'll come back to it after you eat some sugar things. Uh, the scripture in that scripture sound like they're being... Yeah, but my brother's been rational. All right. I'll show you the... Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to go see Yalla, yalla, yalla. What? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, in the Aramaic world, like in all the Christian world, the determination of the, the word of God is what have our ancestors been using? What have the Christians been using before us? Like I said, the Christians just kept using the Septuagint as far as the Old Testament books went. But then you have these letters of the apostles, you have the memoirs of the apostles, Pretty much everyone recognized, if they were Orthodox, they all recognized the four memoirs of Mark, Luke, Matthew, and John. They all recognized those. Some of the heretical movements rejected one or another or just kept one. So, for example, the Ebionites, which come out of this whole Jewish-Christian world of Aramea, they reject all the Gospels except for St. Matthew, the Hebrew Gospel, and they re-edit it so it fits their version that Jesus is the Messiah is really just a, the greatest rabbi ever who renews the covenant of Moses. And they embrace poverty, and there's a whole thing with the Ebionites. And so that comes out of the Middle Eastern world also. There will always be a concrete aspect in the Aramaic world of the person 
of the incarnate Messiah. Where we mentioned to you last week in the Kaddishah, you are holy, O God. When the Byzantines use that, it's referring to the Trinity, God in heaven, the hidden God. When the Syriacs sing this Trisagion, when they sing Kaddishah, it means you, God incarnate, the Messiah. Which is why the Syriacs have no problem adding, you are holy, O God, you are holy, O mighty one, you are holy, O immortal one, who was crucified for our salvation, have mercy on us. Freaked out Constantinople. Because they've interpreted it in a Trinitarian formula, and who's going to say the Trinity was crucified on Calvary? Nobody. But that emphasis upon Jesus as the visible manifestation of God in the flesh, that is very much part of the spirituality of the Syriac world. It's focused on Jesus, 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 and Jesus. Some of our prayers in the Eucharist are addressed to the Father for a moment. But everything is addressed to Jesus. And almost nothing's ever addressed to the Holy Spirit. Now, because the focus of the Holy Spirit is invisible to us, we see effects of God's divinization. The hidden Father is still hidden. Who is the face of the Father? Jesus. Who is the God that, we have, that has walked the earth? Jesus. So our Lord says at the Last Supper to Philip, Philip, have I been with you this long and you do not recognize? Knowing me, you know the Father. Right? Not to say that he is the Father, but he's the face of God incarnate. So it's, I think, actually one of the most beautiful things of the Aramaic tradition that the practice and the spirituality is not airy-fairy. It is very concretely focused upon that presence of God and God incarnate. Now, within that reality of the manifestation of mystery, then the question is, what is the proclamation of the Word of God? Well, we can have for the Old Testament that standard text translated centuries before used by the synagogue before the coming of the Messiah, and it's considered authoritative. But now, what about these letters floating around? All right, we have these different realms. We know that this church over there reads this, or they read that, or they have this, or they have that. Most of Mesopotamia had pretty much the same, what we recognize as being the New Testament collection. But in the Syriac world, there were some of the books that were not accepted all right, for the first century. One of them being the pastoral epistles, All right? So Titus. Um, so what they're referring to the Titus, what they're referring to the pastoral epistles, memory serves me. You've got the epistle, the second epistle of John, third epistle, second epistle of Peter. So some of these they don't accept, and they don't accept the book of the Apocalypse. But many local churches didn't accept the book of Revelation because. It's weird. <laughs> now that's one thing, but it, more importantly, it wasn't so much about the fact that the text is unusual, is the fact that you have all of these really bizarre people giving wigged out ideas because they said, well, it's in this book and this is a holy book. And they're like, hmm. So in fact, until the 500s, so during the lifetime of St. Mary, he wouldn't have been considering the book of Revelation as being inspired word of God. It wasn't read in the churches. Right? We read them in the churches now. We're reading them all the time during the week. We don't read them on Sundays, but we read them during the week, during the liturgies, during the week. During this season of the exaltation of the Holy Cross. Because it's about the end of time and judgment and God's presence. And the book of Revelation is actually about God's presence. It's not about the end of the world. It's about presence. That's a whole, that's a whole other series of talks on what the book of Revelation is. But in looking at it face to face, think about all the weird movies we've had that are supposed to be on the apocalypse. You know, Think about the interpretation of the Left Alone series. The Left Alone series, as far as the Catholic Church, it's just heretical. It's not Christian tradition, that interpretation. The whole millennialism. Millennialism was condemned back in the 4th or 5th century as being erroneous. Jesus will reign more than a thousand years. Right? But they're getting that from the book of Revelation. Because it says that Christ will reign for a thousand years. 
right? You get that problem in the year 999. Tom Holland also wrote a book called Millennium about what was going on in Europe when they're all wigged out since 999, right? I'm sure it was just as wigged out as the whole Y2K hysteria, right? <laughs> yeah? Because people don't change. And so in the Aramaic world, the book of the Apocalypse, the Revel book of Revelation, was accepted only in the 500s. I mean, at that point, they got everyone together, and, and they accepted it as big. So that's our point number eight. Point number nine. Point number nine are, is the great Afrahat, known as the Persian sage. How many have heard of Afrahat? Oh yeah, you. <laughs> you've, read, you've, read, you've read Core Bishop Ben Gianni's book. Right. Now, see these are the kind of texts I would hope that by the time I fall over dead, you'll be familiar with. Say that word again. Falling over dead? No, no, no. no. <laughs> the earlier one. I was going to write it. Right, that's okay. why I'm arranging Because if I keep writing down here, you can't see it. Okay. Because I'm standing in front of it. I'm trying. If I had my angel like Fulton Sheen had during the television, <laughs> it would always be clean every time I turned around. Yeah. <laughs> Do you watch that at all? Remember that he used to refer to his guardian angel. So, all right. So, our point number nine. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Alright, it's usually spelled Afra Hat. Saint Afra Hat, Mor Afra Hat, Mar Afra Hat. Alright? Afra Hat. Okay? Ah. Fra Hat. Okay? Oh, it's gorgeous. I think Syriac is one of the most beautiful graphic, but that's, again, cousins of Arabic, so it just becomes calligraphy and everything. So, Afrahat. This is Olaf, in A, A. So, and then you have P, F. So that's your F sound. This is Rish. R, this is your H, 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 and then this is Ta. So technically, in transliterating this, it should be Afra, H, H, with the T in the top of your mouth. Because there's two types of T. There's a T, with the T in front of you, behind your teeth, T. That's Ta. When did that so script, have, when did that script and then you have begin? Hey. Hang on just a second. In your tet, which is the T, which is shorter at the top of your roof of your mouth. Tuh. What year did that script, how far does that go back? Oh, it's quite ancient. Quite ancient. It certainly predates our Lord. It's the this is the Western so. Syriac script of Aramaic. Okay. There's an Eastern Syriac script, and then there's a third form called Estrangela, which is a Greek word meaning rounded, and it's very formal. And it's perhaps the, most, the oldest. So sometimes you have a book where this will be the text, and then your chapter headings will be in Estrangelo, it'll be a different, different writing style. So you have, you, in theory, you're supposed to master all three of them if you want to read any of the text. So, anyways, Afrahat. We have not just Afrahat, but we have more Afrahat. Okay? Left more. to right. Hmm? Yep. Left to right. Yeah, yeah. Like most, like most of the most of the Middle Eastern languages. And so, even when we, I mean, mentioning about the question of script, you know that what we call Hebrew now, that square letter, is actually a, one of the Aramaic alphabets. The Paleo-Hebraic script, predating the Babylonian captivity, they drop. So the actual Hebrew historical text. They drop, and when they come back, they have adopted one of the Aramaic scripts, which now we refer to as Hebrew, but it's actually an Aramaic script originally. All right. So, Afrahat, who is this? So, Afrahat is born about 280, right? And he dies in 345. So, he's already dead by the time St. Marin is born into the world. 
And he's in that place that we mentioned, Hadyab, Adiabene, northern Mesopotamia, Hadyab. The Greeks call it Adiabene. It's the northern plains of Iraq. So when you're watching CNN, they talk about they talk about Mosul, they talk about Erbil, especially Erbil. That's Hadyab. That's the area that Saint Afraz was born into. And I told you only the last week or the week before that area adopted rabbinical Judaism in the first century. Right. So they are in large part, not everybody. But the royal family converts, and when the royal family works, then all the rich people, that's cool. All right, so we'll all become Jews. So they all become Jews. And then, of course, they're all becoming Jews at the time when God incarnate is walking in Jerusalem. Okay? They don't know this at the time. But once you start having men show up like Adai, or St. Jude, or St. Thomas, and they start bringing you this good announcement that in fact God has fulfilled all the prophecies and the promises that you have been reading about and that your great grandparents adopted as being true, we're now telling you it has been fulfilled and in your generation. And it's like, whoa, boy, my great grandfather was really smart to pick up this religion because now it's even come to its completion and fulfillment. This is awesome. And so, boom. The northern plains of Mesopotamia have been Christian from the beginning. That's what's really important to understand. The extermination going on in the plains of Mosul in northern Iraq is eradicating one of the most ancient places that Christianity has existed pretty much from the beginning. This is tragic beyond description. So I wanted to give you St. Haref's name in the beginning because the people that he would have been related to were part of that Iraqi Christian population who have now been all forced to flee. All right. So, Afrahad is born into this area in 280. So basically a century after it's all churning already with Christianity coming in, right? And he's a, he's a teacher. So he writes, and we have his writings. There is... Catholic U has done a whole series of little books, <laughs> volumes of the fathers. Astronomically expensive if you buy the whole set, but you can always buy like one volume for 50 bucks or something. They're hard about it. <laughs> but you can find, they have one on Afraha, the Persian sh sh sage, all right? Now, that's his common title, because of course that area is on Persia at the time. It's why to this day, Iraq doesn't hold together as a country because most of the eastern part was always part of the Persian Empire. And when the Byzantines were walking the earth, they were fighting in between the Euphrates and Tigris back and forth. And it would just sweep back and forth. And a lot, so you've had these wars going on forever. We're not going to fix it. It's not fixable. And the people in the south that were part of Persia for so long, that's why they're all Shiites. Because Persia is Shiite. It doesn't matter if they're Arabs ethnically or historically. Nobody cares. They're Shiites. Right? So in the north, these Aramaic people were Christians. And so he's associated with a monastery called Mar Matai. Matai. M-A-T-T-A-I. Matthew. Mar Matai. Right? Matai. Right? Matai became Mateusa, Mateusa in Latin, Matthew. Uh, so. But Matai, Mon Matai is a very, very famous monastery, which I think ISIS actually destroyed recently. The very ancient, very, very ancient. They destroyed one of the most ancient shrines of a brother and sister martyrs. I forget the names now, where it was at. It was like devastating. They just, they're just destroying all of these ancient, ancient buildings. So anyway, it's been, this has been catastrophic for the last 15 years. This has just been awful. But he's associated, and some of the stories that the Greeks tell of Afrahat is that he was an abbot at some point of the monastery of Marmatai, but it's not really completely certain. All right? the, monk, the Greeks always tried to make everybody a monk. They tried to make Ephraim a monk. We're going to talk about that. He wasn't a monk. He's not like St. Anthony of the Desert. Right. The Syriacs have their own ascetic form, which is 
what we are descendants of. All right? And it's important to understand the distinction. It's not like Pacomius and Anthony in the desert of Egypt, or even, Bar even, even Saba in Gaza. All right, so he took the name, so his name, birth name is Afrahat, all right? But at his baptism, he takes the name of Jacob, Yaqub, James, all right? Everybody's named Jacob in this area. You have Jacob of Sauru, everybody's Jacob. All right, so he takes the name of Jacob at his baptism. Now, Afrahat is this great writer, as I mentioned. Remember how we talked about in the second century, in the 100s, we have Justin writing his Apologia. He's writing his apologies and the defense of why this is the true philosophy of life. Afrahat is doing the same thing in Syria. You'll usually see them as written as the demonstrations, which is obviously not a Syriac word. Sometimes they're called the homilies of Afrahat. Right? But you want to know what they're actually called. Tahwito. Tahwite. Tahwite. Can't see red. So it's this letter at the beginning. Tach, Chet, Ri, and it's uh, Tau, I think. Excuse me. So we translate this as being the demonstrations, but it comes out as being Tau, or excuse me, Teta, Chata, Wawa, which is like a W, E, Yoda. And not one iota will pass from this law before all things are fulfilled. It's not an iota, that's the Greek. It's a yoda, that little bone. That's why he uses it as the image. The small, and in Hebrew it's the same thing, it's a little uh, that's above the line. This one's on the line. But the yoda, so the yoda. That not one little dot from the law will disappear before all the things are fulfilled. So it's kind of like... Uh, we, I guess like an I, and then another tau, and then kind of an A. Tawito. Right? We're written backwards. Following it this way, if you follow it, we're letter by letter. Alright? So, we, to. So if you want it written up from left to right, it's going to come out. Ta. We, long I, to, in the singular. Tachwite, for plural. Okay? Now, so, what they are is, an, they're, they're meant to be, for Afraha, an exposition of the, of the Catholic faith, the Christian faith. Okay? They're meant to be an exposition. So we call them on, so they'll be on faith, they'll be on the Eucharist, like Ephraim will do. But they're meant to be expositions <coughs> on the Christian faith, right? I like tachwite better than uh, demonstrations. Now he witnesses, now remember he's born in 280, so when he's in his 60s, he witnesses the massacres and the martyrdoms of Shapur II, the Persian emperor, the Shah An Shah. Okay? So in the 340s, you have the persecutions of the Shah Shapur II. Now I mentioned to you one of the reasons why this is taking place in the 4th century is because as the Roman Empire starts favoring Christianity, 
And the people who are Christian in Persia, in the Persian Empire, start looking like a fifth column, subversive. That your alliance is to the Roman Empire. The same thing why they burned down churches, burned down neighborhoods in Philadelphia, the know-nothings in the 19th century, attacking the Catholic populations and burning down Catholic churches, because they said you can't be faithful Americans because you have allegiance to Rome. And so it happened in a number of, Philadelphia was the worst instance. They burned down a lot. If you go to Boston, you know there's an area called the convent. Does anyone know Boston? No? Okay. There's an area called the convent. In fact, there's a metro station convent. There's no convent there. But it was the Ursuline convent that the Know Nothings marched on in the 19th century. It was a girls' school, just like Mercy Academy. They marched on it. At least they were polite enough to tell everyone to get out. And then they burned it to the ground. All right? That's what was going on in the 19th century. It didn't happen in New York City. And there's reasons why it didn't happen in New York City. And that would be a story for another time. But what was the date of that? Which one? <clears throat> of the no nothing's burning down. Mid 19th century. Mid mid sec. It's after the once you start getting all the Italian immigrants and more Irish coming. It's 1840s kind of start problems. I just picked up a book in Portland on the KKK in New England. That's in the 20th century. You had 150,000 members of the KKK in Maine in the 1920s. Now, what's the population of Maine in the 1920s? That's an enormous percentage. Yeah. Yeah. And they were attacking. They were attacking the French Canadians. I don't think the, the, this parish never had any problem with the KKK, mm -hmm. did they? No. But they mar there were marches in Waterloo. There was a leader of the KKK from China. That was. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it was huge. He used to play with his grandson. It's a, fa it's a, it's a fascinating book because we don't, you know, we don't really think about, you know, <clears throat> anyways, it's a whole other conversation. That was religious-based, too, though, was it not necessarily French? Well, none of these, in the, in the KKK minds, remember, colloquial KKK, you know, you have to edit this, but stands for Coons, Kikes, and Catholics. <laughs> Anti-Jewish, anti-black, anti-Catholic. There's no way all of these dirty Irishmen can ever become good American citizens. And so you're meant to terrify them. The burning of the crosses from the Highlands, you know, the story behind it is the Highlanders would burn the crosses as a signal to other, other clans that we're in trouble. That's the meaning behind the burning of, of the cross. Who remembered, does anyone remember the name of Father Coughlin, the radio priest back in the 1930s? Yeah. Father Coughlin. He was sent out north of Detroit to build the parish of St. Teresa of the Little Flower. She's canonized in 1924 or something. And he's sent out, and he's sent out to build a parish in her honor. KKK burned the cross on the front of the lawn of the church. So let him know, you are not welcome in this neighborhood. It was basically farmland at the time. So when he built a church, this is, this is the way a Catholic priest should act. He said, I will build a cross they cannot burn. And he built, through his radio popularity, money came in from around the country, much like Our Lady of Victory in Buffalo. He built a church that seats something like 3,000 people. It's a huge octagonal church, very Eastern style in that sense, but completely Art, art Deco 1920s. An altar in the center, and then there's a, a chapel that comes off of one of the octagons <coughs> towards the main road of Woodward Avenue. And it comes off, and then there's this huge four-story stone column, which is a crucifix. Mm. And because his bishop was also a good bishop, Michael Gallagher, he was also a fighter. <laughs> Michael Gallagher, so you have the angels, the seven angels before the, God, before the face of God in the book of Revelation. You have angels, and all of the angels are stylized, very, very stately, very majestic, standing around the bottom of the crucifix. And the center one, though, is realistic. It's a portrait. And it's Michael Gallagher in the middle <laughs> of the angel Michael at the foot of this cross because that was the attitude. You're not going to burn this one. And to this day, you can see this cross, you know, for miles as you're driving up. Well, you can see it. I mean, it's, it's huge. And that parish became extremely influential at the time. But when you first got out there, and so when you hear those stories, you're like, KKK, the legend is, is the KKK is only the Deep South because they're all ignorant hillbillies. Ha, ha, ha. No. Anyways, that's a whole other conference. <laughs>
so, you brought in Portland? Uh, it's called Not a Catholic Nation. And on the front cover, you have a collection of KKK members in their hoods burning a cross. Because that was the idea. When all these French Canadians started coming, and that's why it was so big in Maine. So the book is essentially about not only New England and Rhode Island, <coughs> but all the whole of New England, but how extensive their activities were and the border with Quebec in Maine. Huge. Fascinating. Really fascinating. Horrifying. But it's important to know history, to know what's come before. I think a lot of those have dropped away because I don't know if the Catholics actually are so much Catholic anymore with their vision. So you're not threatening anymore because it's just like you're just like everybody else, which is basically nothing. So, but if you were Michael Gallagher, or if you were Father Coughlin, you know, you you bringing a different view of the world. And so that's why we're spending so much time. People can say, when are we going to get into the book? The book will make so much more sense to you once you have this context of what we're talking about as being Maronite. So I'm giving you all the build up to the age of when St. Marin is born into this, okay? So Afrahat watches the unleashing of the know-nothings in Persia in the 340s, right? It's the same attitude. You're Christian, therefore you must be Roman, therefore you're not Persians, therefore you're a fifth column, therefore you're a subversive, therefore we cut off your head. Okay? Very simple logic. It's always been around, okay? So, he is witness to these persecutions of Shapur. And as I mentioned, he dies in what, 345. Okay, any questions on Mar Afrahat? Yakub. Okay, number nine then, of course, is the great, the one, the only, Mar Ephraim. <laughs> So this is number 10, you mean, right? Number 10. Did I say 9 yet? Number 10, sorry. And this, 9, 10, 10 and 11 are going to give you the most fascinating elements of what is specifically Syria. I think they're the, probably the most beautiful. And what I found the most attractive, as you heard Bishop Gregory saying, and the two of them ganged up, the Archbishop of Damascus and he ganging up to get me into the Maronite <laughs> church. So, it wasn't that hard, and the more you learn about the Syriac tradition, the more beautiful it is. But number 10 and number 11 are probably the most beautiful. So now I can tell you, when I was vice rector at the seminary for almost a decade out in Minnesota, you do a novena before the Immaculate Conception of the seminary. It's every night after the rosary, we recited this prayer. And they had a prayer that was written, I don't know, by St. Pius X or something, in honor of the Mother of God. But I had come across this really beautiful prayer in honor of the Mother of God of St. Ephraim. So while I was there, back in the 90s, I actually just changed out our prayer and changed it to the different prayer for our novena, which was St. Ephraim at the time. It was very beautiful. I have to have it around here someplace. To prepare for the Feast of December 8th for the creation, essentially. When we talk about the Immaculate Conception, it's the creation of the new Eve. The beginning of the restoration of the human race. And he has this beautiful prayer in honor of the Mother of God. Okay? Oh, okay. So, number 10. Alright. Morda. F. Um, okay. I thought you were supposed to have a little tail there. Mordor. Ephra. Ephra. Ina. There's the vowels. Vowels. We're not diphthongs, it's vowels. Two thumbs are a double letter, uh, uh, so. A, E, and E. Yeah, so you have mor, it's actually mor, morai, my lord. When we say mor, barach mor, it's actually barach morai, but you drop the I. It's like adonai in Hebrew, my lord. And so, 
Adonan would be our Lord. Moran is our Lord. Morai is my Lord. Mor. Right? So Mor and Ephraim. So we use it for the saints. Ephraim. That's why you'll see it when they write it in Greek. They write Ephraim. They're writing with an A, excuse me, P-H-R-A-I-M. Oh, I wrote it twice, never mind. I'm definitely too tired. All right. Uh, can you even see the green? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what they're usually writing, and you'll see, is E-P-H-F-I-M, Ephraim. Because they're, they're transliterating the, the, the um, Allah and the faith, the rish, and then your A sound. This is the reason why it's itraham alain. If you read it like I, if you read it like I don't know. A lot of places they sing it as uh, alain, but it's not alain. It's alain. If there's two vowels, there's two vowels here. There's an up, like your father. And then you have ye, the yoda, a line. A diphthong. Hmm? That's a diphthong. Yes. These are just vowels. So these are the, and again, you know, you find them in the liturgical text, but you don't usually find them. There. Anyway, doesn't matter. Saint Ephraim. Now Saint Ephraim is. Let's see. We got a number of points here. He is born in Nisibis. He's born in Persia, okay? and he's born in 306, around 306, and he dies in 373. He only spends the last 10 years of his life in Edessa, but he's most famous for this period, Urdhoi. Odessa is the Greek word for Ordehoi. And Ordehoi is also this region of the northern plains, what's now southern Turkey, that whole area, which had adopted. So there's a lot of Christians here. And we mentioned to you it's the reason why, because it was such a vibrant Christian community, evangelization went out from Odessa. It went out to the rest of Mesopotamia. And for that reason, the way they spoke Aramaic became the standard dialect, and hence Syriac. We don't use Palestinian Aramaic. So our dialect that we use liturgically will be a language very similar to what our Lord spoke, but it won't be exactly the same dialect. No big deal. But it's, it's, it's an understanding why Syriac became a liturgical dialect. I was mentioning to someone last week. It's like Dante's Divine Comedy. It's such a tremendous work and imposition culturally upon these Latinate speaking peoples of the Italian peninsula, that his Florentine dialect of that Latin of the Middle Ages becomes the standard norm for Italian. But what it's written in, we call Italian now, but it was a Florentine dialect. And actually, quite fascinating, Dante actually thought about writing the whole thing in Provençal, because Provençal was the language of the bards in the Middle Ages and thought about using that for the language of this great poem of its 14,000 and some hundred lines. Same thing with Luther translating the New Testament in German. His German becomes the standard high German because this written text is so important. So Ephraim's writing, that's why you can't under, you cannot over exaggerate the importance of Ephraim's writings because it becomes the standard that becomes the liturgy, that becomes the hymns, that becomes the standard liturgical dialect. Why? Because it's more Ephraim. Because that's what he wrote, and that's what he's given us. And that evangelization coming out from Ordhoi is the reason of what founds and grounds this use of a dialect. All right, let's do one more point, and then we'll let you go. All right. So what happens is we talked about these wars between Persia and Rome, Persia and Rome, back and forth, back and forth. You'll see them on one of the maps I gave you. You'll see where Nisibis is. You see where F, where Edessa is. Just moving back and forth. And what happens is, is Jacob of Nisibis, 
Jacob Benitzvin. Jacob of Nisibis, for gain, first he makes Ephraim Malfono. Malfono. Malfono means teacher. PH, if you want, to keep the standard. He becomes a catechist and a teacher in the catechetical school of Nisibis. And later on, he's ordained as a deacon. All right, so he's first made Malfono. He's made a teacher by the bishop of Nisibis, Jacob, Saint Jacob of Nisibis. And then later on, he's ordained as a deacon. But there's something that will also be unique in the way that he's living his life, which is completely Aramaic, and we'll have to do it next time, because we don't have time tonight. But in the wars of Persia, what happens is, it is when Persia wins its war, and it doesn't matter which one or who the other, because this goes back and forth, on and off, for centuries, this fight over Mesopotamia. That's why we are stuck in the bog and a quagmire that you will never get out, except just going, we're gone, and just walk out. But it will never be solved. It has not been solved for 1,800 years, okay? So, what happens is, is when Persia wins, part of the treaty is that the Christian population, remember, the 340s, you have persecutions by the Shah on Shah. They're persecuting the Christians and the Persian Empire. So part of what the military treaty is after the war is that you allow the Christian population to emigrate west into the Roman Empire. Which, of course, Shapur is completely happy to do. That's why Ephraim is part of the migration of Christians out of Nisibis west. And they settle in Orhor, the other Christian, main Christian capital. It's a very important point of what's going to happen historically later on. And it's there that Ephraim is going to spend the last 10 years of his life and his writings. Okay, So we'll come back to that in two weeks' time, after two weeks. Because next week is All Saints. So All Saints on Thursday means that we have the Vigil Mass at 4, at 6, excuse me, during the week at 6, on Wednesday evening, so that's no catechism next week. And then the following week, I have to go down to Massachusetts for these priest meetings. So I won't be here that Wednesday either. We'll come back then on 7th, 14th, 21st, really one week, and then it's Thanksgiving, right? Mm -hmm. Two weeks. Same week. no? So we have next week's 31st, then the next week's going to be the 7th, so I'm not here on the 7th, and then we start on the 14th. So we'll have two weeks then. We'll have two weeks, Thanksgiving is the 28th? 24th. Any questions? 24th So you get a bit of a break, start reading your books, because we are going to get to the books. But again, I want you just to have this context, because the book will make so much more sense after. All right, we'll finish with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, you are before all ages, and you exist from the age to age. You are resplendent, glorified, and unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light in the of each day. O radiant day, and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah. To him and to you and the Holy Spirit be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, for without end. Amen. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us now before the stream. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll see you in three weeks.